webinar. Thank you everyone. We really appreciate you being here and being a part of this webinar. Um, we are excited to bring Anna Teacup here to share her wisdom with us as we continue our recovery uh, from the pandemic. One of the things we often do before we begin a webinar is remind ourselves of the promise of community action. It's a chance to center and prepare for the learning that is about to take place. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. Such a strong, powerful statement and very good for us to remember. So, Anna, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. A brief introduction of Anna. She's been with the center for uh, six years. She has 20 years of experience in uh, community work and advocacy, and she is a trauma-oriented psychotherapist. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Anna, and everyone, you're going to really enjoy this session. The ways in which the pandemic is um, the way in which the pandemic is continuing, and how we can really support organizations' trauma recovery um, through a couple different strategies, both organization wide um, and on the individual level too. So, um, as I mentioned, I am the um, clinician or psychotherapist at the Center for Work, Education, and Employment in Denver, Colorado. We're a workforce development and anti-poverty organization, and I am the integrated clinician. I provide individual services to our participants, as well as support our staff in our trauma-informed approaches. And something that we have really experienced over the last year, particularly, is you know I think that we, like many community organizations, have for a long time been really deeply invested in a whole-person approach um, in our support in the community, and we're really been thinking through this last year about how to best adapt those approaches, thinking about our staff and our colleagues as well. Um, so we're really going to kind of take that lens of using a strengths-based and whole-person approach when we start to think about how we can integrate a trauma-informed approach to really caring for our organizations. Um, you know, in thinking about the impact of the last year and strategies to move forward. I just want to start with this kind of grounding uh, quote and. Um, just that was a really helpful framework for thinking about how we're moving from the experience of the pandemic into trying to envision a, hopefully a new but hopefully better way of working, normal, a new normal. So it says, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. And nothing can be worse than a return to normality. We really have this like mandate and call to move forward in this particular way. There's an opportunity here. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And what I really want to invite you just in our short time this morning to so join me in really thinking about how do we frame and support that journey if we're moving from um, the way we've been doing things through this kind of trial by fire of the last year into a new way of being together and being in community and, and supporting and caring for our organizations and our staff how do we support how do we kind of center that caring um, in that journey so how we'll spend our time today um, you know, as, as Lena mentioned, I'm a trauma focused psychotherapist and in my practice with, um, really people who are surviving poverty, we really focus on how do we heal and recover both from kind of specific interpersonal traumas people have experienced and the constant and kind of, um, toxic stress, environmental stress of surviving day to day. And that approach is really what we're going to think about integrating in this kind of organizational level as well. And when we do that work, 
there's so many big phases to it, right? We first we we name what's happened. Um, we name and recognize what our experiences have been. We integrate those experiences into our new way of being, our new kind of newly formed identity, and then we strategize about how we're going to be able to be in the world with this lived experience in a way that we can still be our whole selves, have a full range of access to emotions and feelings and work. Um, and so we're going to kind of really adopt that same kind of strategy as we talked today. Um, and we'll really kind of break this time together into three phases. We're going to first start by talking about trauma and its impact, gain a greater under, uh, understanding of trauma, what is trauma, the impact it has on, on staff, particularly, and, and on helpers. Um, and for that layered impact of the pandemic on top of that, we'll move into a trauma informed approach where the foundational and core concepts and principles of a trauma informed approach. And then we'll end our time together today really talking about specific strategies to care for organizations and our staff um, using that approach. So we'll kind of follow these um, three pieces. You'll start to recognize a rhythm. We're gonna, I'm gonna pose some questions just to ask you to think about and put in front of mind as we talk. And then Kind of follow at the toward the end of each of those segments, we'll have some time to get your feedback about those questions and um, also can hear from you and any questions also you have about the initial about that segment that preceded it. So when we start to move into this first session, we're gonna talk about understanding what is trauma. So in community organizing, often we talk about the what, the so what, and the what next, right? So this is the what. What is trauma? How does it impact anyone, individuals, community members? But we're really going to focus today on thinking about how it impacts our frontline drug service staff and how that impact um, ripples through the organization. So I just ask you to think as we talk into this segment about how have you seen this show up in your organization? We can think about over time and we can also really focus on this last year and current state. And also, if you haven't been seeing this show up in your organizations, what do you think might be obscuring it? Why might that be that you haven't been seeing it? Um, so just kind of keep that in your mind as we move into this section together. So what is trauma? Trauma is really, there are, there are multiple different definitions, more clinical, less clinical of that piece, but really think of it as an event or a series of events that overwhelms our body and our mind's ability to cope either all at once or over time. I often like to think about it in terms of resources, right? That it's something that happens to us that either overwhelms our external supports and or overwhelms kind of our internal coping systems. So that experience is different for everyone. A lot of different factors um, impact whether our experience is traumatic to us or not. You and I could experience the exact same event and have very different impacts or very different outcomes from that experience, which can depend on our previous experiences, um, what, we've, what we've survived and been through before, our lived experience, um, what skills we have and resources we have built up over time internally, and also what our external supports look like, right? We know that if someone has experiences, something um, frightening, terrifying, overwhelming, that could become traumatic, one of the main factors of how that impact, the level to which that impacts them is whether they're able to tell people what happened to them and if they're believed and supported. And I wanna hold on to that because that's talking about like the individual impact of trauma but we want to replicate that and think about what does that mean in the organization? How do we hold people's experiences and support them? Um, just that piece helps mitigate the impact. Um, there are different types of trauma, and we'll just really briefly talk about this. Of course, we could spend the whole day talking about these different pieces of trauma, but um, acute trauma, I think, is what we most often think of when we talk about trauma. It's usually a specific incident, right? Often there's a before and an after. So a car accident, a traumatic death, an assault, right? this kind of thing that happened that was terrifying, overwhelming, um, and really impacted my ability to be in the world afterwards. Often there's a shift in kind of worldview, world perspective there. Of course, in experiences um, like intimate partner violence, child abuse, this acute trauma can happen over and over again um, and be happening in a serial way. There's also micro or systemic trauma. So these are traumas that people experience often based on their identities and how they're perceived and treated in the world, right? So when we look at different forms of systemic oppression, this often comes up here. So that the understanding that if I am treated, um, marginalized, um, treated poorly, abused or hurt, 
in ongoing daily small ways, this can also lead to that, in, that traumatic impact. And then that gets, um, you know, built up, amplified by the way which we are treated by systems, systems that daily systems of care, healthcare systems, um, those pieces too, which is really important to call out that this is not about pathologizing the person who's experiencing it, but putting the accountability on the way that the world is treating them. And there's this idea of kind of ongoing, if someone is feeling, experiencing microaggressions daily, that that can lead to a real impact on how to be in the world. Historic trauma, you know, is things that have happened in the past, but still impact us today. So generational trauma, we can think of examples like forced migration, um, internment, slavery, the way that, that this can still impact us today is multi, you know, really varied. Um, it can be in the stories that we hear and tell about ourselves and relational patterns. Um, and we can, you know, we're learning more about how even genetically looking at epigenetics, how this can be passed through. Again, putting the accountability on the context and the treatment of my ancestors and my forebears in the world and how that impacts my ability to be whole in the world today or safe in the world today. And finally, where we're going to focus most of our attention today, looking at secondary or vicarious trauma, right? The, the impact of bearing witness to other people's trauma. And that may be directly in a, um, it's about like um, an EMT or hearing people's stories directly that might be um, something that your frontline direct service staff are experiencing. It can also be dealing with kind of like the collective impact of trauma. If we're doing really difficult and challenging work, even around policy or practice, and that exposes us to so much of the trauma and harm and pain and disparity in the world, that can begin to have that same impact. Um, and then just to name that tra that trauma is really common. You know, it's depending on what types of trauma we're asking about, what people experience or identify themselves as trauma. The kind of statistics num vary greatly, anywhere between 50 to 90 percent of adults reporting experiencing something traumatic. Um, usually it hovers around 60 percent most often. When we look at those um, adverse childhood experiences, about two thirds of people surveyed through that before having at least one traumatic experience in their youth, and about 60 percent of those people report having more than one. So that's just to say, without having like really like how many times has this happened or has this happened, that we know that trauma is common and universal and looks really different for different people. Um, I'm just going to pause it. We will have some time to reflect and ask some more questions, but please do put um, questions in the chat if that feels helpful if they come uh, right up for you too. So, um, how about we think about this, this idea of trauma being so common and universal and then layer upon the last year? Um, it's been so hard and we've seen a real impact in our communities, right? And there's this kind of, I say holding attention because there's, I've heard a lot of people talking about, we're all in this together. We've all, this is the first time we've all kind of had this universal experience of this trauma. And there is so much truth in that, right? There's this universal grief and trauma that's continuing what we're seeing in the world even today, but it's so widespread. And so there's this opportunity, right? There's opportunity for shared experience. There's some opportunity for breaking down some of the maybe power or differentiation dynamics that exist between the helpers in the community and the community members who are seeking support or help. Um, and a wonderful opportunity for increased empathy. And at the same time that there's this kind of universal experience, all of the disparity and in inequality and equity that existed prior to the pandemic continues and exists. And the experience has really exposed and intensified some of those entrenched disparities. So there's this both kind of universalizing and this really um, kind of making more extreme some of the disparities that we've seen, or at least more exposed. I think it's also important to name the impact that this, this pandemic hasn't happened in a vacuum, right? But the year also saw um, a real exposure and reckoning of our centuries long history of systemic racism and how it is so active and present today and the harm that is causing our communities today. It happened during a time of real political um, polarity and destabilization. So that there's this fragility um, and harm that is not just tied to the pandemic, but is kind of part of this larger context. 
and where we can see these statistics here um, that people are really reporting the impact. There's a huge increase in um, people's experience of stress, of anxiety, and depression. Um, and that, that is happening tied to work too, because the impact of much of this has been so much disruption um, in our work environments, in our workplaces, and the way we're able to do the work, as well as an intensity in what maybe we're seeing as helpers in the harm we're seeing in the community that we're trying to support um, or work against. So that's just say that there's just kind of this a lot, right? We think about this year, and we really think about again if we go back to this kind of definition of trauma as disruption, it, d disruption in our relationships, and we'll talk more about that. That that hasn't been so intensified and amplified over the past year. And I think it's where we come up with this kind of harrowing title to the workshop, right? Like the pandemic continues. There's this idea of these future reaching um, parallel or shadow pandemics that are going to be lasting for years. So even as we see maybe cases go down and vaccinations go up. We are going to see lasting years long impact on our community's mental health, on the racial disparities in healthcare, and the job loss, and how that is impacted women and women of color, particularly in food and housing insecurities. What does this mean? It means one that we have to shift from an acute response to think about an acute crisis to a chronic, to thinking about this as a chronic need or a chronic crisis, a chronic um, context. That's going to cause us to really try to shift and adapt the way we're responding to it and to kind of create this additional attention, right? We have this, this need to keep changing and adapting at the same time that our staff and our organizations are, and really everyone in our community is experiencing this high level of adaption fatigue, right? We're so tired of having to innovate and adapt. We're exhausted. We're tired. So, how do we resolve? The tension between innovation and exhaustion. And I'm going to oppose that we do that by centering care, by using a trauma informed approach where we're putting the people and their lived experience first, identifying real organizational structures to care for them, and then move into the work um, that we have before us. So, Going back to just some of the impact of trauma, and we're going to kind of try and keep these kind of lenses of both the last year and our kind of ongoing experience of working in community and organizations. In the experience of trauma, our thinking brain goes offline. We kind of move into this flight, fight, freeze mode um, because we're surviving. We're in survival mode, and that happens. What we call this out is because that happens in organizations too. And we can start to think about organizations. How are the ways that organization? And gears up for the fight or just gets stuck and frozen. What do we avoid um, as an organization when we are feeling tapped for resources and exhausted and overworked and overwhelmed? It creates the ultimate contradiction, the need to kind of bury and forget and the inability to do so. So when we look at individuals who survive trauma, this looks like um, kind of symptomology around numbness and withdrawal and wanting to not depression, not wanting, you know, this kind of shutting it down and this activation, right? The inability to forget nightmares, um, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts. This contradiction, because we're not able to process trauma in the, the way we typically process experiences, that kind of stays present and on our, like in our current state. And this gets replicated in organizations that are experiencing trauma too. So we're gonna kind of talk about what that shutdown and activation kind of contradiction looks like in the organizational response. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. This is so huge, and this is a primary impact of trauma. So we think about our work in communities being based on relationships and building relationship, then the experience of trauma writ large is disruptive to those relationships and our ability to kind of make connection and meaning. And I think that's really important to hold on to because that gets in the way of us doing our work effectively. So, how does this impact helpers and responders? There's kind of two things we talk about secondary trauma, which is really about that specific exposure to trauma. It's a cumulative effect, it can mirror some of the signs of PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder and compassion fatigue. So, we can kind of take these a little bit on a spectrum. Compassion fatigue is really the stress or suffering as a result of serving in a helping capacity. It is a natural outcome of knowing about trauma and working with survivors. This is one of the key things I hope we can take away today is really thinking about compassion fatigue 
as a natural and expected outcome of the work. It's not about, uh, it's not a flaw or a weakness in our staff. It's something that we want to be anticipating and expecting um, our staff to experience. The way I like to think about this is if our work is impactful, we will be impacted. So as an organization, when we're thinking about caring for each other and caring for our staff and colleagues, we need to expect that impact, have an ability to recognize it, name it, hold it, and respond to it, support it. So we're really shifting from problematizing these, you know, problematizing or avoiding compassion fatigue or burnout and really thinking about it as an expected impact of doing the work well. And that if we're going to continue to have that work be sustainable, we need to address it. What does it look like? This is where, you know, that question about like, how are you seeing it show up in your organizations? You might start thinking about um, your colleagues and your staff and how you might be seeing this show up on the individual level. So those signs of compassion fatigue, uh, muscle pain, impaired immune system, increased exhaustion, um, the need for more time out for illness, uh, emotional, the guilt, feeling one, the feeling that one can never do enough. Also anger and cynicism, numbness. So again, we see that contradiction, right? Like, Turning it down, numbness, withdrawing, or a kind of overreaching um, intrusive component of working all the time, people overworking, not being able to set those boundaries, feeling like um, either persecution or martyrdom, kind of moving into those different responses that make it less possible to be an authentic relationship with our communities and to sustain the work. Cognitively, we see lower concentration, rigid thinking, and preoccupation, diminished creativity, right? So those are starting to get attention. Like this is, if this is the exhaustion, how do we have people to continue to adapt and be innovative when this is happening? Behavior withdrawal, sleep disturbances, um, substance use, that inability to even listen or kind of be present and how that can be disruptive in the work environment too. There are some particular risk factors um, when we look at the compassion, um, exposure to compassion, fatigue, or secondary trauma, our own lived experiences, the type of exposure. So if we're seeing direct trauma, if we're witnessing it happening or hearing people's very um, stark and real narratives and stories about their trauma, that's a higher risk for the compassion fatigue, the length of employment. And this is something we want to hold on to too. We, we're, we're so many of us are thinking about turnover and how support retention and the length of employment increases the risk to this. So we are we going to increase our supports the longer we have people. Sometimes we put so much of our efforts into the onboarding and those new staff. How do we support our longer term staff? Um, the need to always be empathetic in our professional and personal roles. So many of us are doing this work because it aligns with our values. And so actually the work itself becomes part of our identity and our sense of self and who we are, which is both a motivator and can create this vulnerability. It's harder to turn off the work. It's harder to set boundaries and step away and contain it. So there's some risk factor there because we're doing this work that has particular meaning to us. And isolation. And we think about the impact of isolation in the last year as people have worked remote, um, maybe been isolated alone in their homes or with their families, but that lack of uh, many of our usual and natural supports that we build in that around being with others, going places, being in community. So what is the impact on the organization? We, again, we're really centering and forwarding, um, front, um, placing in our front forward thinking the relationships, right? It creates fractured relationships. We move into coordination versus collaboration. The struggle to produce high quality work, the inability to stay connected to mission and value and purpose, right? So if we're doing this work because of our values and because we believe in the mission, but then the work becomes too hard to do and overwhelming, it becomes really hard to connect to that piece resulting in high turnover, increased costs, um, and that focus on compliance rather than innovation. We're just trying to get through, get the numbers, do what we need to do and get out, instead of really being innovative and investing in the work. Um, you can see this is a small, small premise that says it's always sit, stay, heal, never think, innovate, be yourself. And this idea that we kind of eclipse the individual, we eclipse some of that motivation, we move into this fatigued state, and we move into that compliance. So we really want to disrupt that Again, so that our work becomes more impactful, impactful and more effective. And then ultimately, we're trying to shift into a new cycle where we're really thinking about if we can have this kind of trauma informed agency culture that's supportive. Um, that impacts the individual or individual staff members who are then able to provide more effective 
um, service delivery in our communities. Then where we can, our communities have more resilience and um, are more able to seek help and stay in relationship with us. You know, again, improving our agency culture in this kind of positive caring cycle. So we're going to, I would love to hear from you now what you're seeing in your organizations, what you have. So let's kind of return to those same two questions. How have you seen this show up in your organization? Um, if you haven't seen this, what might be getting in the way? What might be obscuring it? And I think we're going to move now into, you can see here on your screen to go to minty.com and enter this code. You have an opportunity to answer these questions in real time. At the same time, if you have additional questions and answers, please do feel free to put them into the chat and I will um, do our best to respond now. So if by chance you haven't used Menti before, just open up a browser and type in menti.com. It's going to ask you for a code number, and that code is 8046-3260. It's on the screen here. As after you put the code in and hit enter, this question will come up. How have you seen this show up in your organization? Type in your answer and hit enter and it'll show up on the screen. This is a new tool we've been using that we really like. Yeah, I'm already seeing some themes that I've heard from a lot of people about this, this sense of kind of um, feeling overworked and under-resourced, right? The blame, I see blame going around. The ability to just get the work done. Um, and that's, I think, so often interpreted as like, we, we often move into this kind of account, accountability piece and we see that, right? Like, well, how is it possible? What do you need from me? And people, I think, and people aren't saying this yet in their responses. And I'm curious about how, what you're hearing when that, when we try to address that, I think we so often hear, what do you need from us to get this done? And people are having a hard time answering that question too, right? The idea of like trying to even come up with the solutions feels impossible for the people who are talking about being overworked, under-resourced. Other things that you are seeing show up in your organization and your responses? Oh, yeah, this whole idea. I mean, we're still in flux, right? This idea of transitioning from work and receiving services remotely from to transitioning back into the office. And we'll talk about some of the considerations throughout trauma informed lens about a return to kind of the physical workplace, too. But I, I think we're all experiencing a lot of those tensions, right? Like, okay, great. Our, our, um, our participants, the people we're serving, are have better internet. In like some ways, they have better access, especially if they have internet to us. It would reduce some barriers or transportation, maybe. Um, but it, feels hard. It's a different, we're starting to, I think, get the fatigue of what it means to be on Zoom and phone calls. Um, yes, we miss, this person says people miss seeing customers face to face and they miss the interaction. And we, my guess is that we're missing each other too, right? So we're missing the people we're serving and we're missing our colleagues. We're missing that, that sense of camaraderie. And when we think about how to build charge resilience, which is something we'll talk a little bit about, camaraderie is such an important part of that, that kind of the, the relationships that happen in the in-between spaces, down the hall, over a lunch break, right? That we're missing some of that, even no matter how many maybe Zoom attempts we have to have a staff meeting that's fun and use those, IC, those team builders, we're missing that face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I think I'm seeing so much about capacity, right? And overwhelm. We're really seeing that show up. 
these, let's go ahead and move into the second question. If you haven't been seeing this, or you feel like you're seeing it only in particular ways, what do you think might be getting in the way or obscuring it? What, what might be keeping us from seeing what's happening? I mean, some things I'll, I'll, I'm going to just talk through while you think of your responses and keep uh, and put some answers up. But I really do want to hear from you. I think like, the hope is to have us be as interactive as we can in this format um, and learn from each other. And, you know, that disruption to relationship is a huge part of it, right? I mean, whether that's the physical disruption of people being remote, yes, we're not seeing exactly, we're not seeing each other face to face. How to assess how people really are. <laughs> yeah, I love it. The straight up denial, right? People, it may be too much to name. I mean, this is something that is a real parallel when we're doing, when I'm doing like direct psychotherapy with people who have experienced trauma, it's terrifying to name it and to face it. And what does that look like in a work environment where you, where naming it may, whether this is the culture of the workplace or not, it may feel way too vulnerable and scary, right? The lack of trust to speak up and say, I'm struggling, um, I need help can be so hard, especially if we maybe don't trust that we're going to get it especially in a time with so much economic instability, where we need, if we have jobs, we need to keep them, right? Um, lack of communication, not inquiring about it directly. I love that um, feedback. I think we're gonna talk to Celia about how do we, how do we ask people so they can answer the question? Um, yeah, and just that attention to COVID employment issues, I mean, it's, it's, there's so much to attend to right now. It's for those of us who are really in the role of maybe we're supervisors or leadership in the organization. And even with our colleagues, there's just an overwhelm of everything that we can attend to right now that can get in the way of having those conversations or being able to be vulnerable enough with each other to have them. And so I think I want to think about, um, and so when we get to some of the strategies, I think about how do we make sure that those conversations are happening and kind of with some mutuality, right? That if, if I'm asking people to tell me how they are, I'm also talking about how I am and how we build that trust that way. Um, oh, yeah, that red tape and the learned helplessness. I think we get into this place when we start to experience increased trauma and compassion fatigue, the feeling of scarcity can be so overwhelming too, right? That we're in competition for resources um, and that sense of scarcity is so hard. And one thing I wanna think about, um, um, and I think, uh, Denise, we can move into the next slide. And um, thank you so much for all your feedbacks. I think um, when we're thinking about that, we want to think about um, these are some just some framing questions that we'll come back to towards the end of the segment. Um, at least we're talking about foundations of a trauma informed approach. But I want us to think about the ways in which we were talking about, like the overwhelm of things we're attending to, the red tape, the lack of communication and trust. Is there a way, and this goes to this kind of second question. So, you know, just as a, just for your reflection, as we start to talk about some of these trauma informed approaches, is it want you to think about the ways that there's already alignment in what we're doing. So we're going to think about the strengths and where there are gaps and how we build buy in for shifting toward in this direction. And what you just named as those like, um, obscuring factors the things that get in the way and how those have been amplified intensified during COVID can provide us some framework to get buy-in for shifting to a more caring and trauma-informed approach and say, okay, we want to we want to use this opportunity of envisioning a new future, a new way of being by centering care. And we can use what we've seen in the last year to try and build buy-in. This is the way it's not working. This is what's getting in the way. How do we and start to think about how we frame that for our staff, how we frame that for our community, our stakeholders and our funders, and just kind of use this opportunity, which is real, right? We're not minimizing the real harm that our communities and our, and our organizations and our staff are experiencing, but how do we use what we're seeing to create a framework to build buy-in towards a shift? So we're going to spend just all the time here talking about some of the really um, key and really kind of foundational concepts of what it means to be trauma-informed as an organization. A trauma-informed organization has an awareness that we live in the world Trauma is in the world and so it impacts us and the people we work with. It just assumes trauma. And, 
In an organization that is trauma informed is rooted in the knowledge that healing is possible and self care is essential. And it's a framework for supporting those we serve as well as ourselves and each other. So that's what we're going to think about this, these concepts as a framework. There are four principles of a trauma informed approach. Commonality, we all have a story, right? This is, this is about, again, centering the whole person, thinking both about our participants and customers and our staff. This is not a call to need to know everyone's story, right? We want to respect people's autonomy, um, privacy, and we just assume that there is that we all have a lived experience, and those lived experiences inform the way we're able to seek help and provide help, and the way we're able to do the work. We bring that to the work. Um, mutuality that healing happens in relationships, right? So we're really continuing to center relationship. If trauma is a disruption of relationship and connection. A trauma informed approach is going to center the relationship building piece. Intentionality healing requires us to be informed and take action. With knowledge comes responsibility, right? So that we think that healing isn't just going to happen by showing up, but we have to invest in the relationship and the work. And potentiality that healing is possible for all. This is really when to use this as a call to move from vicarious trauma toward resilience. Now, Often when we hear people, I mean, resilience is such a buzzword right now. We hear it so often. And so often when we hear the, the thing that um, I become kind of afraid of sometimes when I hear people talking so much about resilience is that it's so often focused on the individual. What are the individual skills and characteristics and qualities of a resilient person? Um, and I would like to challenge us to think differently about resiliency, that resiliency happens through relationship. And so that we want to move towards vicarious resilience and mutual resilience. That's not about helping someone identify what they need to do to be resilient, but how we can build relationships where we witness people's resilience in a mutual way. I'm seeing their strength. They're seeing my strength. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're building towards that kind of mutuality. And the resilience lives in the community or in the relationship. A trauma-informed organization creates safe space for all participants and workers. Staff at all levels are aware of the impact of trauma. So that's like when you step off the elevator, what does that look like? Because our frontline staff has training, <coughs> excuse me, our leadership has training, our administrative staff has training, that, that is throughout. <coughs> It meets people where their needs are. Um, that's so what we just heard someone talk about assessment in the last piece, um, how hard it is to assess when we're not face to face. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and that we want to meet people where their needs are. So assessment is a piece of that. We need to know what their needs are. It aims to prevent re traumatization. So many of us are working in different systems of health, and people have really varied experiences of entering those systems. How do we think about the shift? How do we make it a different or more comparative experience to come through our doors, um, literally or virtually, <coughs> so that we can prevent re-traumatization? It strives for healing, recovery, and resilience. And again, it assumes trauma. Not people's individual specific experiences of trauma, but that trauma is in the world and is likely to be part of the fabric of our community and part of the experience of the individuals with whom we work. So being trauma informed really is a question of, man of managing the impact of trauma is requiring the shift in perspective. We're really thinking about moving from what's wrong to what happened. Um, that's a huge piece of it. I just thought Oprah has a new book about what happened to you, um, looking at trauma and the impact of trauma. So even Oprah is bought in and we're thinking about what does this mean? Not what's wrong, what's gotten in the way, what are your barriers? But I, what happened to you? Again, not an invitation for our um, community members or our staff members to ask specifically what's happened to you in the past, but we're changing our perspective. The idea is to increase our ability for both empathy and curiosity so that we're going to step back from interactions. We're going to step back from presenta behavioral presentations, how people are showing up, the things that we saw that, um, showing up from that first segment, and pause and be curious through an empathetic lens, but I wonder what might be happening. I wonder why it might be impacting them. And then we can join in them with them. 
um, moving from what's wrong to what's strong, right? So the strength based approach um, is a huge piece of it and moving from compliance to impact and really thinking about how we structure that, how we talk about that, um, how are we measuring that? So I think there's a real call here to really think about our outcomes. Um, we really think in a non in kind of a nonprofit um, world in the United States historically, we had heard so much about you know funding for programs. What is your overhead cost? What is the cost that you provide? How much that goes directly to the community? How much goes directly into programming? How do we how, how do we continue to maintain that value? All right, impactful direct service and shift our framework a little bit so that we can talk about the need to also invest in our staff and our organizations. We know firsthand, I'm sure you've all seen the impact on our community and who we're attempting to serve when we have high rates of turnover, when we have irritable, unmotivated, overwhelmed, overworked staff. How do we create a narrative that talks about we put our so much of our energy, we put our resources into our staff? And that gets out into the community. That creates a security, a stability, so that our team, our organization, our staff can contain and hold the harm and the pain that our community is experiencing and help transition that, right? So the trauma informed piece, we so quickly jump from our programs to the people we serve without the role of the staff being in there. So we really want to center that. So I want to come back to these questions again. If you have, I see a few comments, if you have comments or other questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And we're gonna we're gonna return to our minty poll and see what are you thinking when you when we think about these foundational concepts, um, these really principles of a trauma informed approach. Are there obvious ways that already feels like you're doing this and aligned with your current practice? Um, and thinking about that piece. And we're going to move into specific strategies about kind of integrating and applying these foundations, but really thinking about just kind of thinking about your mission and your value and your overall um, practice and programming. Where do you already see alignment? If those of you aren't looking at you, you can see that code back up there on Minty again. Um, Ashley just put it back in the comments too, so you can click back there to see um, the question piece. Again, we can think about those concepts around mutuality um, and over about relationship building. Where do you see relationship, I think, as the center there? Um, innovating and using technology. Yeah, that, that service gap, right? Um, and I think um, this, re this, this response here is, I think, something that probably many of us are thinking about. Like, what does the return look like? We're trying, so many of us did this very fast innovation to moving virtual. And what does it look like to come back? What are the what are the things you want to carry forward um, from our innovations in the last year? And what wasn't working so well? What do we miss? How do we build back in both of those pieces? It's such a huge question. Um, <clears throat> and innovating, right? How are we using technology? I know um, our organization has really been giving out, really partnering with our community to try to figure out how do we get how do we get internet and Latin computers in the hands of our participants because that's where the relationship exists right now. Right, so then we think about, okay, if we can move back to some return to in-person work, do, what, do we what do we pull forward with that technology? What do we gain and lose? And I think that question of how we start with a relationship and the importance of relationship, both with our staff and with our community members and the people we're attempting to serve, we start with the relationship, then that helps us ground decision-making around continued technology, continue the virtual world, um, versus in person or in addition to in person. Again, where are their pathways for relationship there?
Any other responses? Any other places where you're really seeing some of these approaches align with your current practice? Or I think even we can also think about like the way they align with our mission and vision of our work. Okay, Denise, you want to go ahead and move to the next question? We can do that. Um, we have one more prompt here in Menti. Thinking about that buy-in piece, and we're going to look at this question for a few minutes here, and then let's take a little break to breathe and move and uh, get a drink of water if you need it, and we'll come back after this. But let's stick with this question here for a minute. How can you, how do you see opportunities to build buy-in for shifting in this direction? And I know we're still thinking ahead about these more specific strategies, but if we just think about Talking about a trauma informed approach, talking about a trauma informed organization, do you see an opportunity for building buy in to shift in this direction? And I think think broadly around your current staff, um, I'll think about your stakeholders and funders. Yeah, that's so huge. I'm, I'm seeing that too, right? Like, how do we think about that primary piece of intentional planning? So, yes, I love this getting the input and feedback from all levels of staff. Huge. Like, right, we're thinking about this at every level and really trying to think about that kind of empathy perspective building. What has this been like for each level of our staff to switch remote if they have, um, to remain in person if others have switched remote and what that impact has been? Um, really think about that return. And I think I love that you put intention on there, right? We talked about intentionality as one of those core principles. And so many of us are in this organizational planning process. We're working with our boards. We're working with our stakeholders. We're working with our staff to think about, okay, now can we breathe? We did this crisis oriented. Switch we, I can remember my own experience, um, talking with our participants that we have, um, an, uh, uh, have had for 35, 7 years, an in person training program. That's really focused on community building. And I remember in March talking and say, okay, well, we may have this coming. And within the next week, we were all remote. Right? So we were in this rapid fire crisis or response. And now we have this ability to move into intentionality. Increasing partnerships, that collective impact to share the innovative ways to improve multiple processes. I love that. Looking at the collective. Uh, being aware of people's comfort and getting back and being with each other. Right? That's it's. It is we, I think so many of us. I will speak for myself that this moving in and out of trepidation and eagerness, right? And how do we become nimble enough that we can get people's input um, and feedback on what feels safe to them, what feels comfortable to them, and hold this knowledge that that is going to shift back and forth for many of us that are really thinking this um, piece and then that constant reevaluating protocols. I love that. We're going to move, when we talk about strategies, we're going to talk about like how important it is that. We are doing ongoing and kind of really regular structured assessment, both how we're doing as an organization and how we're doing as individuals. And really thinking about that constant reevaluation piece. And how do we do that in a way that feels structured so it doesn't become exhausting, right? We don't want to have asking people, okay, keep thinking about this because that feels often, even if that's not our intent, like a call to action. How do we create structured um, capacities in different places at different levels? For people to assess and talk about how they're doing um, in a way that hopefully feels responsive and generative and not part of this kind of reporting cycle. Thank you all so much. This is such this is such lovely feedback, and I see so much alignment with what people are experiencing um, across organizations and um, across the country, really. So let's let's pause here. Um, let's take a long five minutes to just uh, Take step away from your workspace if you can. Move your body a little bit. We're talking about movement and breath. Um, we've been talking about trauma, which I think even talking about it in this kind of abstract conceptual way can also bring up some of our experiences. Continue to so I just encourage you to shift for a minute. Go move your body. Take a drink of water. Do some breathing. Let's plan to come back and um, move into the next segment at on the hour. So depending on your time zone. That might be 10, 11, 12, 1, but just come back and be ready to rejoin um, on the hour. And we'll look forward to moving into some specific strategies that we can use um, depending on our location in the organization and that we can bring um, into orienting and centering the care for staff.
Great. Thanks, Anna. We'll be back at the top of the hour. Okay, right, we'll go ahead and come back. We already had a time just to breathe a little bit, take a quick break and move. Um, you know, I was able to do the same and let's move into with our main time together, really thinking about some of the specific strategies that we can use to mitigate the impact of trauma um, and really respond to our organizations and our teams with what they're experiencing now. So as we move into this kind of really specific strategy component piece, I really want to encourage you to reflect on where are you currently focusing most of your efforts to support staff? Do you feel like you're over indexed in some places um, and, and others are kind of just left to lie on their own? Where are most of your resources going? What innovations from last year can you continue? Um, were there changes to benefits, to time off, to work um, schedules? What worked about that? What can we continue through and how can we use? This framework of the trauma and trauma approach to help kind of um, again build that buy in and move and continue some of those innovations that we were able to be flexible with over the last year. And then think about what strategies still feel like a reach and what resources you might need to start to integrate some more of these strategies. So, how do we attend this? How do we really think about caring for organizations and our staff? Um, in the context of the last year and broadly in trauma broadly, we want to integrate these trauma informed strategies. We're going to assess current functioning, which is an ongoing process, and we want to really think about how we assess at the individual, departmental, organizational level, and the systemic level, and identify response strategies. Here, we really want to ground our uh, efforts in thinking about prevention and intervention being um, mutual and simultaneous. That the more we're able to really intervene, support our staff, that it prevents continuing down that spectrum of vicarious trauma and burnout, that we're really thinking about the intervention being the prevention here. Again, we're expecting the work to have this impact. And so it's not about stopping the impact, it's about being able to recognize and make space for it and respond to it. So we really want to think about using a trauma-informed approach towards assessment. We really think about assessment in five primary domains. I think these are really helpful. We start to ask questions about return to uh, in person work or what the work will look like and the workspace will look like in the coming years um, and months or weeks, even. We're making these decisions so quickly with um, such evolving information, but really thinking about safety, trustworthiness, choice, empowerment, and collaboration. So, really thinking of those um, different domains as we start to ask questions and make plans. There are some really wonderful assessment tools out there. Um, the tri Express Institute um, has a trauma-informed assessment that's really um, helpful there. And the very own uh, National Partnership has a trauma-informed organizational toolkit for homeless services that I think are really adaptable depending on what services you're doing. And included in that is an organizational self-assessment that really does help pull out those different levels of staff, the different environments of the organization, and really think about how are we doing um, in, with regard to a trauma-informed approach. And then on the individual level, and this is a tool we can really think about how to incorporate in our professional development and our supervision, it is a professional quality of life scale. I really like the scale. It really it asks people to kind of place themselves in this and scale themselves and place themselves on the spectrum between compassion fatigue and compassion um, uh, quality, uh, professional quality like uh, fatigue or satisfaction. So it really it has that strength based piece too, but really. Um, is useful in placing ourselves kind of on a spectrum there. And if we use it regularly, we can see how we're how that's shifting back and forth over time and try to see if there's patterns there based on our work demands and the year of those pieces. So again, the foundations for supporting organizations, we're going to strive for a culture that normalizes and expects the impact of trauma. We're really wedding that prevention or response piece. We're going to think about a structural support for work-life balance. We're really going to aim to support both collective and individual resiliency, moving back to that mutuality piece. So, what are some of the specific strategies that we want to think about? At the organizational leadership level, we think about what are some of the policies and opportunities that exist at the organizational level to really care for our staff during this transition. So, front of mind for so many of us is the return to work considerations. Um, how do we center safety, empowerment, and choice in relationships, right? Those are those trauma-informed principles. You know, 
I was just reading this um, jail did a, did a big study. They asked over 2000 people um, about return to work and 2 thirds of respondents um, say they wanted access to an office. We are also hearing so much, I think, about people, the benefits of working remotely or having that flexibility. So how do we allow, enable empowerment and choice within, of course, the constraints that we might have about our physical demand or our service model, but how do we kind of build in that piece? Maybe that looks like they have a shared office, that they have a, a schedule that people are in and out of the office. What does that look like? How do we, and then how do we really center relationships? So if people are partly out, partly in, how do we build community? What does that relationship look like? Do we come in for some things that are primarily around relationship and community building and task work is done off site? Really kind of thinking about those domains and those return to work considerations. Sustainable workloads, the primary people report, the primary factor people report that contributes to some of their fatigue is a sense of overwork. We saw that in what you're seeing in your staff and organizations. And this is really about experimentation and a willingness to ask and listen. Is it really the number? Is it the task work that's involved with each case? Is it um, how do we diversify what a, what a workload or a caseload looks like? Are we asking people where do they get the most energy from in their work day? What brings them joy in the work? How do we, which is likely going to be different for different people? Can we tailor workloads accordingly? Can we think about how we um, shift some outcome measures. If we're really looking at impact over compliance, if we're looking about at uh, impact instead of numbers, how are we serving more than who, how many are we serving? Really kind of trying to find some frameworks for adjusting the measurements. Maybe we experiment, we drop down caseloads for some people, increase them for others, and we see what the outcome is. And we use it and we say it, this is a pilot. We think about that piece. How do we, part of it is how we, hold on to and capture that kind of flexibility and nimbleness that we had over the last year in a way that feels more intentional and more structured. So we don't build up that kind of adaption fatigue, but we create, but we kind of, we can increase or maintain that responsiveness. Um, schedules and PTO, we really encourage organizations to think about what does a schedule look like? Not just in terms of time on time off, but looking at everything from the daily cycle, how do we build in breaks? Um, a lot of research tells us that a, a break is needed every two hours of work to continue the sustainability. How do we build in breaks? Do we let people have empowerment and choice about when they take those breaks? What does a lunch look like? Um, where, where do we build trust by having people have ownership and autonomy with their schedules? What does that look like over the week? Um, our organization has a flex schedule, so we work mostly nines, but we have every other Friday off. And that's really intended towards wellness and well-being. Um, we have experimented with a quiet week where we don't book any appointments for a week. We don't take calls. Um, can you have sabbaticals? What can that look like? Um, are there meeting free weeks, especially when we're still primarily virtual? Is there a way to have a Zoom free day once a week or once a month? So really thinking about those, the need for rest and break and sustainability on the daily, weekly, monthly, and annual cycles. And then thinking about the agency culture, the use of that time off or the use of that flexibility needs to be modeled and transparent by leadership. And the autonomy and the sense of control over um, schedules, of course, needs to attend to the role, right? If they need to be there for certain hours to take calls, to see people, that's essential to the work. So we wanna think about role specificity, but the need to take a break and rest and have autonomy can be modeled by leadership and given, in, really provide with really explicit permission throughout the organization. And then benefits and salary, you know, a trauma informed organization is gonna pay a sustainable living wage and offer access to mental health services. Hopefully through, you know, that may be through EAP, that may be through community partnerships, but really thinking about what we're able to provide and model um, for our staff. And then organizational policies, um, really thinking about Peer support? Is there a way to structure peer support into the organizational rhythm? What does that look like? Is that formal? Um, are there staffings that are peer to peer? Um, is there mentorship programs? Are there identity based um, support groups? What is what does the peer support look like, and how can that be structured so it isn't just left to those um, water cooler chats and breaks over lunch, which are still helpful and meaningful? 
but how do we structure in peer support that may include supervision or management, but, but also has opportunity to not include that for really that peer to peer relationship um, piece and with structure, right? So there's a, still a purpose to it. There's a meaning attached to it. Thinking about opportunities for service activities. Um, maybe your organization does a service day once a year. Maybe people are uh, incentivized to volunteer, but the idea of focusing, doing other types of work that are still aligned with the mission and values of the organization gives people a sense to kind of have a reinvigoration of their sense of purpose that can the capacity to connect to the mission by doing the work in a different way, um, as well as community building and relationship oriented. Really centering professional development, seek opportunities to have professional development take place in new environments. I mean, I am, it's like wonderful in the last year how many different webinars and online trainings you've been able to attend and see. And I'm so glad you're joining this one. I think there's just such a robust offering. And if we're still doing that learning, but we're still doing it in the same place that we've been working where we feel a sense of fatigue, um, we're doing that from home, and we're doing the laundry while we're participating. It's both that same tension that we might be seeing with our program service delivery, right? Increased access, but decreased connectivity. And so how do we look to build out professional development, either virtually or in person, in a way that has a new mode of learning um, in a new environment? And how do we tailor it to tenure? Again, we focus so often on either the required skill building piece or the onboarding piece when we come to training and development. How do we increase professional development as tenure increases and knowing that tenure can be a vulnerability to fatigue and that retention is a huge part of our efficacy in service delivery. And then finding structure for celebration and appreciation. How this integrated into your organizational operations. Um, really thinking about a high recognition environment where we know that and typically the people who do the best to get the most positive feedback, the people who are struggling get the most negative feedback. How do we create ongoing structural ways to provide universal um, opportunities for celebration and appreciation? We have information that tells us that people who work in high recognition environments, their morale is reported up 73%, their engagement 64%, and productivity also goes up, right? So we feel good about the work we're doing. We're more able to sustain the work. Um, again, this really aligns this idea of, the, of that trauma foundational principle that healing happens in relationships, that the connection is a huge part of it. We want to look for ways to make use of supervision. It includes assessing and planning for trauma impact regularly. Um, this, I think, is such a huge takeaway. I find it is so important in my own work and being on my own sustainability. It's interesting this concept of ramping up to the work, sustaining the work, and ramping down from the work. And bring that into, into supervision, into our conversations. How are you going? What does your week ahead look like? How are you going to prepare to come to work, to be present, to be able to do the work? While you're here this week, how will you sustain the work? What can you do? What boundaries can you put in place? What is your focus for the week? How will you sustain the work while you're in it? And how will you ramp down and create the boundary and be able to move away from the work? And that feels so much more challenging sometimes when we're working from home at different hours that we require this flexibility, but it can also be harder to find containment and boundaries around the work. So really bring that explicit conversation and supervision. Asking about impact and not status. Um, I just remember saying that uh, the average person says they're fine 14 times a week and it's only meant 19% of the time, right? So how are you, but how is the work impacting you this week? How are you, how is the work showing up for you? What feels different this week? You know, thinking about what the cycle is and really asking to explicitly about impact in a way without judgment that it's that anticipating this impacts all of us. How does it impact you? Encourage the way problem solving, you know, externalize problems, we them, how will we approach this? Monitor time off usage, encourage breaks, and integrate trauma awareness and share self care plans as part of regular evaluations. It says share because we want to have that again, that mutuality. If I'm creating a self care plan, you create a self care plan. We have mutual accountability across the roles, across relationships. Um, and then again, on the individual practice, this needs to be taken up at, again, every level of the organization. So, how to make that practice visible, supported, and accountable, right? So, again, we think about always ramp up, sustain, ramp down. There are a lot of tools online you can look at for individualized self care plans, but those. 
find something that you think meets your organization's needs, aligns with your vision, and then integrate it at all levels of the organization and make it shareable and accountable, not around shame and judgment, but about knowing that in order to continue to do this work, that is hard. You, I expect you to have a plan about how you will sustain it and how you care for yourself in the same way that I expect you to have a plan about how you're going to care and serve others. I also do that work. Here's my plan, right? A real mutuality. See connection and identify strategies to contain the work, movement, breath, and rest, and continue learning. You know, it's so we get stuck, right, in repeated patterns. We get stuck in that conflict of kind of the numbing and the intrusion. Content, relationship and continued learning moves us through that piece, provides some of that flow that we need. That was a lot of that was a lot of information really quickly around specific strategies. So bringing it back to you and thinking, giving you a chance to for a minute to just to reflect um, back to the initial question, thinking about where you currently support most efforts, what innovations you can continue, and, and thinking about strategies and resources. Um, let's move well, for our last time. Let's move back into Minty, and I would love to hear what you are seeing, what you've experienced, where your resources can lie, and where you can reach for them as well. So, where do you currently focus most efforts to support staff? I'll give you, I know it takes a second to get over to Minty. You can also put things in the chat too if you're struggling with Minty. Here you might think about are we spending all we have a lot of resources, we have a wonderful PTO, yeah, flexibility flexibility with schedule and PTO. Um, I think a lot of us have really experienced an expanded ability to be flexible with schedules over the last year. And I think really thinking about that piece is important in PTO time, right? So much of our efforts, which is wonderful if we encourage the use, right? PTO is only as meaningful as it is as we use it. So I know I've talked to some organizations that have lifted caps on PTO. Um, this year, because people haven't been able to take vacations, and there's like this pressure: do we keep that lifted? Do we reinstate it? You know, whether it's through a cap or just through supervision, we need to be modeling and encouraging people to use that PTO. I'm really thinking about separating out that you know, health and time. Is there a way to make health time wellness time in addition to health and needs? Is there a, is there a proactive component to health time? Can that be separated from can't pay time off? Um, Oh, this is so huge. I really love that you're doing this, supporting staff, working from home with hardware and supplies, right? And I think there's this, there's a, probably a new resource question there. I know we're going to ask about resources here in a second, but we did a lot of that quickly. You're going to move home. Do you have a laptop? Do you have a phone? What do you need? And it was in this kind of crisis-oriented emergent piece. Um, and so as we start to think, increase our intentionality about what the continue to work looks like, are there new needs? If we might say, okay, now we're going to do a hybrid model. You'll be home. You can continue to work from home. What additional things might you need to be able to do that in a way that feels comfortable, that creates boundaries, um, that protects confidentiality? Some of those, some of those kind of really important considerations around efficacy and ethics. Um, we can, can kind of come back online now and really come to our surface right now. Um, so let's take a time, Denise. Let's go ahead and move to the next question slide. What innovations from last year? This is really related, but one of it, what innovations from last year specifically do you think you might be able to continue into the future that feel really aligned with this trauma informed approach? I think we saw that really right with that flexible schedule already. Like, is there a way to maintain that? How has that worked? What have been some of the outcomes? So this might also be a, an invitation to really think about, okay. Even just a catalog, I think we did it so quickly. We did it so fast and so urgently. We may not even be aware of all the innovations that we made, right? So how do we kind of take stock of those innovations, take inventory and think about what some of the outcomes have been and what we can move forward? Anyone have any specific feedback or want to share with the group some specific innovations that felt really helpful to you? Um, yeah, using that, so using social media. Increasing, um, that's wonderful too. Really thinking about what is your presence, what does our virtual presence look like, um, both with our I think with our staff and 
you know, I think a lot of us are also thinking like, okay, we, we decided to use teams. We decided to use WebEx. We decided to use this. How do we explore what that can really do now? Now that we're moving out of kind of crisis mode into really um, filling out some of those virtual environments and how we use those and not flexible scheduling. Scheduling is so huge. Yeah, flexibility with PTO, work from home, flex environment. I love, I love that. I love that you're already doing that daily, weekly, and monthly cycling, right? You're thinking about that informed. Feeling informed is so protective against exhaustion and fatigue, right? If I know what's happening, especially in this climate right now of so much information and so much destabilizing information and so much change and unknown, um, even in even in my therapeutic practice, I hear so much about this, the fatigue of having to constantly make choices when there's no, no obvious good options. How do we protect staff from that? Information, transparency, thinking ahead, those are huge pieces. I, I love that you're doing that. Um, and let's go ahead and move into the next um, slide, Denise. That'd be great. Are there strategies that we looked at there that feel still like a reach? That either feel new or just like, I don't know how we would ever get there. Like, I think it's helpful for us to think about What's in the what lies in the future? What's down the path that we could that we could strive toward? I mean, I kind of wonder about even what flexible schedules, how that still feels like it's like thing we've already done. Is there a way that it feels hard to maintain or continue? Um, I think some of us are really grappling with even just like, but well, we have this building. How do we use the building? Do we shift? Do we use our space differently? Do we sell things off? What does that look like? Do we have, when can we have more people, right? This kind of idea of this tries to feel like a reach. And what is supervision? I, I love to focus on that piece too. And I didn't say this earlier, but to call out our efforts towards the middle management too, right? Where we sometimes think of them, we can we can easily put people in the kind of supervisor box and need to think about how they're also needing to be support. So using that mutuality piece. So are there places where we are really in, kind of entrenched in this hierarchical structure within our organization? And so that mutuality might feel like a reach. Um, and building from that place might feel like a big kind of culture, organizational cultural shift. So I think that's helpful. I encourage you, I don't see a lot of responses here, but we'll, we can continue to move forward um, to the next slide. But I do encourage you to kind of think about where are we reaching to, which is both feels like a hard question now when we're all feel so tapped and our cups feel fairly empty. And this idea of where can we strive toward? How can we continue to build innovation? And then I think our last question is really around resources. Right? So thinking about what resources do you need? Do you have the resources to meet the demand? How do we name and identify what the demand is, what the need is, and how do we ask for those resources? What are the framings that we can use to communicate the need and ask for what we need, ask for those resources? I mean, I would be shocked to not see funding on here because right, that's something that we're always thinking about. What are the other types of resources that we gain to help us shift in these directions? I think some of us may also be feeling a sense of overwhelm right? when we start to think about what resources do we need? Where do I start and where do I end? Right? The resources that I need are so plentiful and so many. So this is also just an invitation to really think about how we frame the question, how we frame talking about what we need, how do we reach back to those early slides about what people are experiencing now, the impact of the last year, how do we reach back to what we're seeing show up, and how do we use this framework to start to identify some resources that we can use or that we need to shift in this direction and move forward. So one thing, this is a, this is a yeah, additional grant funding, right? And I think there's this there's going to be this interesting world next year where there is both 
maybe a lot of funding coming from some places and a lot of what well, I'm looking at like donor based funding or looking at grant funding, or maybe a restriction too. And how do we think about moving from crisis to chronicity, crisis to longevity, and use that framework to really position the way we talk about this work and ask for that additional funding? I think in, we would. Um, we can move back to the slideshow too. I really appreciate all your feedback. Um, so I think I'll wrap up by just providing, sharing some learning resources around this model, um, which I think is a huge part of it. Like we need to have time and space. So one of the time when I think about resources, I often also think about time and space. How do we have a resource? How can stepping away from the work in front of us be a resource? Um, so that's that's huge. Um, there's something like how we should be thinking of private philanthropy and its role. So huge, right? And there's so, I think then when there's a crisis that's so broad, the competition, how do we move away from competition to resources to partnership, looking for opportunities and connection there? Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, going back, the idea like kind of step away and increase our ability to reflect and learn is a, is a huge resource. So again, you'll get this recording and you'll have these slides. So I'll just go through these quickly. Here's some wonderful books. That talk more about trauma what it is but also these ones around trauma stewardship and help with a helper really strong strategies and tools to support our staff who might be experiencing that, that compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma some great websites um, about moving towards a trauma-informed approach and specifically around compassion fatigue and that quality of life scale and some wonderful articles that are really recent from this year that are really looking at the reflection of what we've learned from the last year um, the impact it has had and what are some of the strategies and things that we need to be able to move forward in healing um, and in relationship. And finally, I'll just leave you. I love this short poem. The beauty of my people is so thick and intricate. I spend my days trying to undo my eyes so I can see. I love this poem because it's rooted in the beauty and the strength of our communities. It communicates to us that it does impact us and we have to do something to take care of ourselves in order to be to remain in relationship and remain in community. And it's beautiful and it's hard. So again, also here's my contact information. I um, love uh, hopefully obviously talking about these themes and these issues um, and would um, love to continue the conversation outside of the webinar as well. So here's my contact information. and. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. I know we're all so busy in the world right now. Taking the time to learn together is um, a wonderful opportunity. So thank you so much for your time. And here's some references and then I'll um, hand it back over to uh, Lena and Denise. And thank you everyone so much for your time. Yes, thank you everyone. And I just wanted to make you aware of the new opportunities we have here at the partnership. Um, we do have a new leadership coaching and technical assistance program, a peer to peer. So if you are aware of an agency director who would like some coaching, this is a possibility. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We have some webinars coming up as well. Um, I'm gonna go through these very quickly. Um, we are working with CFP be on some uh, rental assistance, the new rental assistance program that's uh, being operated by many community action agencies that will be held next week. Next slide. And we've been working with the um, with Melanie Herman from the nonprofit risk management center on an eight-part webinar series, and we'll be doing part four. May 20th, and this is on crisis management and crisis communications. Next slide, please. And her fifth webinar in that not creating fractal action oriented readiness plans will be in June on the 17th. Next slide. And here's the contact information for our CARES team. If you would like any additional information about these opportunities, feel free to e email myself or Ashley. There's also lots of information available on the partnership website. I did put in the chat another workshop we're doing next week, a webinar on 
trauma informed care. And I hope that link that's in there will work for you to register if you'd like to participate in that workshop as well. So, I want to express my appreciation. Thanks to Anna for sharing this very in depth, deep. Webinar about trauma and hope that you will be able to uh, tap into the resources that she has on the slides. You will get a recording of this webinar and the slide deck available to you in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to have those resources and can use those uh, in a way that works best for your agency. So thank you, Anna, and thank you for sticking with us for these 90 minutes and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks everyone.